So, Brokahannis, I'm Leon, the Paperback Maniac, coming at you with another vintage horror book review. Today, we are taking a look at Doppelganger by Eric Higgs. This book was published by St. Martin's Press in 1987. This is actually one of my favorite St. Martin's Press covers. It's absolutely gorgeous. And uh, for once, you can tell that the artist actually did read the novel. You know how sometimes you see these covers, you read the book, and you get the sense that the artist didn't even read the book, was probably just going off like an art director's command? Well, here, that is not the case. Uh, this artist, whose name, according to uh, the signature there, is Burleson, uh, actually did read the novel and was able to render its uh, themes and ideas into uh, quite a sexy and eye-catching cover, in my opinion. So, uh, yes, I will uh, begin by reading the synopsis from the back cover, as usual. Demonic Desires. Everybody bullies Marvin. Big but gentle, he's the perfect easy mark. But don't be fooled. Marvin knows the meaning of revenge, at least in his dreams. Grisly dreams of swift and bloody retribution. And Marvin's dreams are coming true. Something deadly and unseen is at work. Something mysterious and powerful enough to turn Marvin's grimmest whim into chilling reality. And that something is the dark mirror of Marvin's soul. The doppelganger. And then after the synopsis, uh, something that you never see are some uh, blurbs from uh, like reviews, like newspapers. We've got a blurb from uh, Mystery News and San Diego Union, uh, and that is very, very rare. So right there, that should uh, indicate to you that, that there is something a little different about this book. It's not your usual uh, kind of like St. Martin's Press uh, pulp horror paperback. So, um, so this novel starts uh, in medias res with quite a bang uh, when our Wimpy yet physically imposing protagonist, Marvin Moy, has had it up to here with the cruel and cantankerous boss of his, uh, Mr. Sam, at the uh, gas station where he works. And he just loses it, throws the old man on the concrete ground between the gas pumps. He like drops a knee on the man's chest, clamps a hand over his uh mouth and then uses his other hand to grab one of the gas nozzles and then shoves it between the man's lips making his dentures uh, slip out and uh says quote think i'm a fuck poke now mr sam think i'm a goddamn fuck poke now and then he mercilessly starts pumping gasoline down this old man's throat and uh he is saying uh hold steady while i fill her the fuck up yeah, there we go, you old son of a bitch, and just watches as this old man uh, slowly dies and a puddle of gasoline you know, grows around his head. But then Marvin wakes up. It was all just a savage dream, of course. Because, you know, as bad as Mr. Sam, his boss at the gas station is, Marvin would never dream of doing anything like that. Certainly nothing physical. Because, you see... Marvin is what society you know, at one point might have called a milk toast. Uh, forgive me, I love that word and it does not get used enough. Uh, he's basically just a very you know shy and sort of spineless uh, guy. He goes about his life, um, you know, so he's uh, what he's 24 years old. He lives in San Diego. He works at the gas station, has absolutely no friends. Um, he's just uh, lacking in, you know, confidence, charisma. He's a sensitive guy. He keeps to himself. He likes to take jogs on the beach. He's artistic. He likes to paint and draw at home. But, you know, you know, from societal standards, he's just like a total loser. And um, Marvin is a guy who is sort of like at odds with his nice guy persona. Um, so every now and then, you know, 
these feelings that he, you know, completely represses uh, come boiling up to the surface, such, such as a scene early in the novel when he's going on a jog and he sees uh, a stray cat with a mangled paw and he tries and he stops and tries to coax the cat to come to him so he can, you know, try to help it. And the cat comes over, but then viciously uh, scratches Marvin and runs away. And then Marvin kind of just loses it for a moment, gets really upset and thinks like, Damn it. He's like, what I should have done was just wring that stupid cat's neck and put it out of its misery. He's like, you know, and then, and then he has this moment of just like red hot rage where he thinks that this cat, you know, is, you know, should, should, should be destroyed. But then he like comes to his senses and thinks, no, no. He's like, you know, I, I really should go back and try to find that cat, maybe even adopt it, right? Um, try to take care of it. So after he finishes his jog, he goes back and, and looks for the cat to see if he can find it and take it home and then discovers its, uh, corpse in a trash can with its head viciously wrenched halfway around. And so, so that's a little odd, right? So, so, uh, now Marvin, uh, he works at the gas station, as I said, and there is a, a pretty redhead who comes every Monday, uh, for a fill up and like a, like a check up on her yellow Volkswagen rabbit. I remember those cars. I think my dad used to have one of those in the 80s. And Marvin uh, has a real big crush on this on this girl. Um, and uh, so, you know, she comes to the gas station. And then when she leaves, Marvin uh, can actually follow her in his mind. Because you see, Marvin has a special talent ever since he was a kid. Where he can see things that are happening uh, in far off places. So, Will, while he's still at the filling station, you know, servicing other cars, mentally, he's watching, he's following this girl uh, drive to her college campus. She goes to UC San Diego, and he watches her go to class, and then he follows her uh, as she goes to um, the professor's office and starts to get a little upset when he notices that the professor is kind of being a little inappropriate in the office. He start he sees the professor kind of catching glances, lewdly watching, uh, like glancing, leering at her, looking at her legs under her skirt, and then he becomes furious when the professor uh, goes to this girl and starts actually full on like coming on to her, like like kissing her full on on the mouth, grabbing her while the girl is like kind of weeping and like kind of meekly protesting and. And trying to, to stop it. Marvin is thinking in his mind, someone needs to bang down that door and put a stop to this. Someone needs to be, be, beat the shit out of that professor. How dare he, right? Someone needs to teach him a lesson, uh, beat the living shit out of him. Even if she tries to stop it, like uh, he needs to just go after this guy. Well, as he kind of visualizes that, um, uh, like a couple hours later, uh, two cops show up to the gas station. Uh, one of them is a detective. They ask to speak with Marvin and they say, hey, Marvin, um, do you happen to know a, a woman, uh, this pretty young redhead by the name of Genevieve Collier? And then Marvin is thinking, um, I don't think so. They're like, yeah, she drives a yellow Volkswagen Rabbit. And then he's thinking like, oh, shit. He's like, oh, he's like, uh, why? And then they're like, well, do you know a Professor Willings at UC San Diego? And Marvin's like, no, I don't, I don't know that person. And they say, well, interesting, because uh, just a couple hours ago, someone busted down this professor's door and beat the living shit out of him. He had to get his jaw wired shut. Uh, and, and they're like, and the girl who was in the room and witnessed this has described you to a T, like exactly. And then Marvin is thinking, well, this is, uh, he's like, that can't be, but he, but in the back of his mind, he's remembering, you know, this vision he had at the gas station of, of you know, someone um, doing that exact thing to the professor. And Marvin thinks, well, no, no, no. I, he's like, I was here the whole time and, you know, and he has an alibi. I mean, his, his boss, Mr. Sam, um, you know, confirms that, yes, he was at work when this happened. Marvin says, why don't you take me uh, to this Genevieve girl? We get this all cleared up. So the, the cops take Marvin uh, to the hospital where Genevieve is staying because Genevieve got a little roughed up during this incident as well. And they take uh, uh, Marvin to the room. And as soon as Marvin uh, enters the hospital room where Genevieve is staying, she gets one look at him and just loses her shit completely. She starts like screaming, bawling at the top of her lungs, uh, scrabbling away from the bed, trying to get away from him. And, um, and this is just really, you know, really odd, right? Well, I mean, the good thing about this, though, is that uh, her sort of action, reaction there it makes little Genevieve look nuttier than a Snickers bar. So the cops are like, well, clearly, you know, she's kind of lost 
lost it a little bit. Maybe she's, you know, she's just confusing you with the real attacker. Uh, so they decide, okay, you know what? We're going to let you go. You do have the alibi. And uh, they let they let Marvin go. Of course, Marvin is completely, uh, you know, depressed now because this girl who he really, you know, had a crush on, a girl who, by the way, he has been, um, you know, making portraits of at home. You know, not that that's creepy at all for an adult to do. But, uh, you know, this girl is just completely now terrified of him and, you know, has completely lost her mind in a way uh, because of, of this. And so he he's sad, but then soon his sadness... Uh, calcifies again into red hot anger and he thinks that bitch he thinks you know first of all he says um you know i only wanted to help you and then he's like how dare her you know treat him like he's some kind of villain and then he goes to the portraits of genevieve that he had been working on at home rips them to shreds and just you know he's totally beside himself well that night, uh, Marvin is dreaming of flying across the city, and then he finds himself in a hallway, in, in a building, and he realizes that he's in a hospital. And then uh, he's walking through the halls of the hospital, and then he hears a voice in his head, a voice that says, you know where you are, Marvin. You know why you're here. Go, go to her. Take care of this. And then this voice leads him to a room, and he opens the door, and of course, inside the room is Genevieve, uh, like, lying in the hospital. And this, this person, uh, you know, Marvin, in a, in a sense, goes up uh, to her bed, uh, quietly slips inside the bed, easily subdues her when she wakes up, and he, uh, well, you can guess what he does. <laughs> this is an 80s novel. He, let's say he ravishes her, uh, and then he continues to do this uh, over the course of, like, the next few nights. Every night, he shows up in her room, and, and, he, and he rapes her. And she eventually, this girl, uh, slowly loses her mind even more, eventually resigns herself to this. And uh, it's actually very terrifying, you know, the, the, the thought that, I mean, imagine being like stuck in a, like a hospital room and every night being visited by a shadowy figure who slips into your bed and rapes you. I mean, just absolutely terrifying, right? Well, um, so... Things like this keep happening, right? People who start, sort of piss um, little meek Marvin off are finding, uh, are, are you know, finding these grisly ends, right? We get some people who Marvin works with. Uh, you know, Mr. Sam eventually is going to get his comeuppance. That professor uh, is not, uh, you know, Marvin's not through with him either. And these things happen. And, you know, and, and the question is, how, you know, how is this happening? Um, you know, clearly it's not Marvin, but, but then again, clearly it, it is related to Marvin. Uh, so, so in a sense, I mean, the, the, the title kind of gives it away, uh, the doppelganger. Marvin uh, has, you know, repressed his feelings for so long that uh, eventually his id has sort of manifested itself into a murderous doppelganger, which is, you know, taking care of business, which Marvin is, is, is too sort of, uh, you know, meek and, and uh, cowardly to take care of. So, um, yeah, I, th I think that's a really high concept idea, really, really fascinating. Um, I mean, it, it, it's kind of refreshing because there's really no evil in this book. I mean, unless you consider a, a man's subconsciousness uh, evil. I mean, really, this is just, you know, a disconsolate, deeply uh, dissatisfied man who has repressed his true feelings his entire life. Finally, it all comes boiling to a head. And, uh, you know, this id, which has been suppressed, has manifests itself uh, in the real world and, and is, is uh, you know, taking care of business, right? So I thought I thought that was a really, really cool idea. Uh, this book moves. Uh, I mean, it's a lean book, and it and it does not waste any time. Uh, the chapters were nice and short. I really appreciated that. I, I don't know what it is. I've really come to dislike long chapters. It just takes me forever to read a book. I, I, I am loath to even pick up a book if I'm like, shit, like the next chapter is like 30 pages. Uh, this book just moves really fast. Uh, and it's just, um, you know, really gripping from, from beginning to end. 
uh, yeah, so I really, really dug that. The characterization here is is also really good. I mean, so we get Marvin. We also get uh, a character who Marvin starts to to talk to after this whole you know thing with Genevieve kind of falls apart with the redheaded girl. He starts to sort of talk to his the apartment manager at the place where he lives, um, and and then she's another interesting character. She's a woman who is also sort of dissatisfied with her life. She's coming to terms with the fact that she's growing older, and um, you know, and sh and her she feels like her life is not really what she had envisioned it would be and she you know she kind of likes Marvin she kind of finds his shyness and timidity uh, a refreshing change from the usual douchebags you know that she's dated in the past who just kind of use her for her body uh, and then just like kind of dump her right and Marvin she senses is kind of like a like a like a better person like a good guy deep down and she tries to you know help him and of course you know Marvin eventually is going to like to like try to ex explain what's going on to her and say how these things have been going on and and she's she's tr gonna try to help him but um you know really like what can you do though like this is like an inner like an inner sort of uh antagonist right like when the when the when the villain is another part of you i mean you don't you can't like you can't uh vanquish yourself right so it's kind of a it's kind of a tricky it's kind of a tricky thing but um, yeah, I, uh, I I really uh, enjoyed this book. I thought it was it was different. It was refreshing. Like a lot of St. Martin's Press books, also uh, quite well written. Uh, this book, I thought um, St. Martin's Press, I've noticed, is just uh, they they're kind of head and shoulders over the other imprints in terms of the the quality of prose of their writers. They were a lot more. In fact, I would uh, venture to say that um, they might be the like the most reliable imprint when it comes to. Um, you know, like good prose, certainly better than the writers that like Zebra and Leisure and you know, even like Pinnacle were publishing. So the writing in this was 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 good. A lot of uh, good, clean imagery, evocative without you know going overboard with the descriptions. Um, I, I I really enjoyed it for that. But um, Doppelganger gets uh, my high recommendation. I think you guys should check it out if you're looking for something a little different, if you're looking for, you know, uh, a swift moving, uh, interesting uh, kind of horror tale that is a little more on the psychological level. Uh, you know, this book is not afraid to go to some dark places um, and it's and it has some good drama in there, <laughs> even a little melodrama. You know, there's a scene where... Um, you know, Marvin's kind of this girl that Marvin's seeing convinces him to try to go see his parents whom he's been estranged uh, with for a while and, uh, you know, talk with them. And we learned that Marvin had like a sister uh, uh, who had died when she was a teenager. And the sister was kind of like the favored one of the two, but that she had met like a like an untimely end with an accident. And we get like a dark revelation uh, regarding that sister and something that might have happened uh, to lead her to have that untimely end. And um, and then we get like a dinner scene that uh, just devolves into complete melodrama between Marvin and his parents, and it's almost like a little like ridiculous. But I I, I for one never have like disliked melodrama, so I didn't mind that. Uh, but uh, yes, yeah, so you get a little drama, a little melodrama. You get some horror. You get some psych psych psychological horror. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's pretty much, you know, what I'm looking for when I'm picking up one of these books. Not too long. You can read this thing in, like, just a couple of days. Uh, so, yeah, Doppelganger by Eric Higgs. Definitely gets my recommendation. I say check it out. So, uh, that's the review, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, come back soon. I hope to be starting my, uh, Satanic Summer a book review series in the near, very near future. Uh, that should be a lot of fun. So, um, definitely check that out. Until then, I'll see you guys later. Peace out.